trying to get into this whole business. This is a very awkward photo of me during my teenage years, you know. And uh, what, what I did was I came across this, I had a magazine for teenage girls and there was a, some code in there, some basic code that I just copied and put on this old computer, 386, uh, I think what it was. And um, it was supposed to be a game where you try to guess a number, so really simple code. And I copied it and I had to change a little syntax error and it worked and it was quite a great feeling. And then I wanted to make it better. I wanted to be able to guess the number until I actually got the number right. But because I didn't know anything about loops, I got into a whole big problem and so many different paths and I gave up at some point. But I came back to it. Uh, I went to school and there was a little computer club there and I tried myself on these things. And I basically, I was told a lot that I was wrong there because I'm a girl and I should go, but I sort of stuck with it because I was stubborn. And um, going more into it, I started to focus my um, learning on computer science. So I went to a different school that was very technical and I also went to university and did computer science and I really focused on the theoretical parts of it, right? So I learned about logic and uh, mathematics and all that kind of stuff and it started to dawn on me that this might not be the right field for me to work in. I was interested in so many things and I, I loved sort of puzzles but what we, are, we were taught was that we are going to be the high tower architects that are going to make those, those amazing models and then we have our minions that will code them for us. And <laughs> in the end, um, we would also get rid of those people because we can automate everything and generate the code that we need. So of course now I know that it's sort of a very academic view about how software is developed and that it's totally not real. <laughs> But it was very, it dawned on me that I didn't want to work this way. And it, as a student, I did a little micro um, processor programming. And I had a little problem in my code where I just used the one instead of the variable i. And of course, it was an endless loop. And I didn't find the error for a day. So I was very frustrated. I didn't know what to do. And no one seemed to know how to get out of this problem. I just said, oh, you know it's easy or you just do it in your free time. So there was a bit of uh, an understatement. And that became really bad in 2010 when I actually got depressed because I was trying to finish my studies and I was very perfectionist and I tried to do this amazing thing which of course didn't work. So I was very frustrated, didn't get anywhere and I couldn't really see myself as a software developer or someone working in the industry. And especially since I started to figure out that I didn't want to work alone and working alone was the worst and I wanted to work as part of a team. So good stuff happened. Um, in 2012 my friend took me to a meetup for the local software craftsmanship group and that's where I met Nicole, who you can see here. And Nicole um, told me about these different ideas and I also went to a course for extreme programming and they told me about things like tests, automating your tests, test-driven development, working in an auto autonomous, te auto autonomous team, uh, working on features together, being proud in the stuff that you do, and actually liking to code and to work together as a team. And I tried this for a week with a couple of other students where we participated in an extreme programming course, and it was so much fun, and I figured out this is actually what I want to do. So I joined a company that was advertising that they, their mission was to work this way with their clients, a consulting company in Germany. And um, after two weeks, I was sent to the client and it got hit with reality, right? And um, it was quite fun uh, to be there. And I learned a lot, like in the first year, because I, t I started to work on tasks in the sprint team that I had no idea how to do. But I just you know, threw myself into it and asked a lot of questions. And there were so many patient people that helped me and taught me how to do this. And I did a lot of pair programming. And um, I was also invited to the Software Craftsmanship and Testing and Conference, Socrates. And that's where I met Ali. 
who you probably recognize because he was standing here in the morning. And what he did was uh, we sat down on the code retreat, which is where you practice your coding with someone. And he was this amazing expert, and I was this green newbie that had no experience at all. And he sat down with me and taught me TDD as if you meant it, which is an advanced technique <laughs> for someone um, that was as good as me. And what I learned from that was that this community really cares. Even if you're a re new person that comes in here and has no idea what's going on, someone will talk to you and someone will try to help you. And you can ask your, your questions. People will even listen and to your ideas and are interested in your opinion. And I was seen no longer as a person that didn't have any clue what they were doing. I was seen as a new interesting person and all my I, I was valued as a person. So I really loved that. And I came in, in, into one of these conferences and I was um, there was Doug Bradbury who worked on the software craftsmanship manifesto and he talked to us about what it actually meant. So software craftsmanship is a movement that strives to raise the bar in software development. And the basic idea is that we had this whole agile revolution and we were focusing on delivering value to our customers and we want to bring together the extreme programmers and the business and we want to help make them talk to each other. But then we sort of fell into a, my boss calls, Simon calls this an agile hangover, where we sort of realized these are all great ideas, but maybe we don't have the technical skills to push up the new features every week or every month, or maybe we don't have the technical skills to maintain a code base to be constantly able to change. So there were sort of things lacking, and people got together and said, okay, what are the things that are important to us? So they got together and um, they put the values from the Agile Manifesto on the left side and said, yes, this is great, but we also want more. So in the Agile Manifesto it says, not only working so uh, we want working software, but we also want well-crafted software. What does this mean? A craftsman is someone <coughs> who takes pride in what they do and they, uh, they have their passion, they have their work, and they want to do it great. And it's also about the product inside having a good quality. So when you buy a table from a wood craftsman, you know that it's a good table and it won't break after you use it for a while. So that's a good thing. Um, then the next point is not just responding to change, but also steadily adding value. So I've had experience at customers where people would just try to build their CV or to try the latest thing and they were able to respond to what the customer wants pretty quickly, but they wouldn't focus on delivering value. And in the keynote, you heard about this, that when you finish a feature that can actually give you profits, then you want that out to be as, out as soon as possible so you can get those profits and work more and invest more in your software. So the focus is not just on being responding to change. It's also on what really brings value. And for me personally, it means that when the product owner asks me to implement something, and I know this is going to be a huge change and it's going to take a lot of work, I ask, okay, so what's the minimum of this that will give you value? Because this is a really new feature and we know nothing about this. So it's gonna be really hard to get it right on the first try. What is the minimum of this that will be valuable to you? And then they can say, okay, I don't care so much about the holiday feature because, you know, Christmas is a while away. So we strip that away and you implement the rest of the feature first. So we're doing that. Um, we already deliver value with minimum effort and then we get some feedback and can improve our understanding of the domain. The next part is that we don't just want individuals and interactions, but be part of a community of professionals. It's very profound for me because I joined this community because of their values and because of their practices. And um, they run meetups all over the world. They run, uh, they run code retreats, they run coding dojos, they run talks, workshops, open spaces, conferences like this. And they also mentor each other. And you're really part of something. And in a way, I'm an idealist in <laughs> being part of something great gives me another motivation. So whenever I struggle with something, I can refer back to the community and ask them for their opinion. 
So I'm not alone, I'm not just a lone warrior working on something. So that's a big important part. And we can use this in a company as well, as was mentioned in the keynote, and just getting together people that are passionate about a certain thing. All right, and past part is, it's not just about customer collaboration, but also about productive partnerships. And what this means, for example, is that when I'm working in a project with, I'm a consultant, so I go to the client and I work with them, and there may be another consultancy in there. And let's say they make a mistake, or I make a mistake. As a tradition, my company could tell me, oh, please hide this, or please try to blame it on the other consultancy, you know, don't make us look bad. But that's not professional. And that's not very productive. So we're trying to work with everyone that tries to help this client to build their product and in a way that is not about being um, trying to fight each other but actually trying to develop something together. When I went the first couple of days I went into a new project I was asked to review the code of another supplier and then to compile a document and send this document to a manager so that the manager can give it to their manager and that manager could give it back to the developers and tell them, you have to fix these things, your co code coverage sucks, all this kind of stuff. So instead, I pretended I didn't know about this and just created GitHub issues. Right? So directly, I communicated with the developers. We had Google Hangouts where we called them and talked to them about it. And I sent them links to blog posts about good design. And what started was a productive partnership between us and this other supplier, which was very important when we went live and were using that product and had issues and tried to fix them together. So it's always a struggle when you work in a real project to get the politics right because everyone wants to you know, shine and look, look good in the eyes of the client. But it's really important to take care of the productiveness. And honestly, I don't want to work in an environment where, where this doesn't work. So I try, and if this doesn't work for the client, then maybe it's not the right client for me. So this is just an example. All right, so what happened afterwards? In 2013, I started exploring more this whole field of software craftsmanship, and I went to conferences, I went to community events, and I noticed in my company there was something missing. We were talking about being on the forefront of this XP techniques and agile software engineering, but we didn't have any way to um, improve ourselves. So I started the coding dojos. Every month I would get people together and say, let's practice together, let's practice some code, do some katas, and you know, practice refactoring, practice test-driven development. And the company said, great, we're going to give you a room, and we're going to give you beer, and we're going to give you pizzas, but we're not going to give you time off work. So the coding dojo was um, sometimes successful, with lots of people there, sometimes less successful, and people started to fade in and out of it. And it's quite understandable, because when you are working 40 hours a day for a client, which is very intense, then afterwards, going in the office again and trying to work on something, you know, just in your free time, it's not, it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of effort. So what I'm advocating for is that you watch yourself and see how much energy you actually have. Because you can fall easily into this trap of being so excited about all these new things that you neglect your personal needs and you just go and do all the things, like wake up at 6 a.m. to read blog posts or, you know, don't talk to your colleagues on the commute because you have to listen to this new podcast about clean code. So bear in mind your personal needs as well, but maybe try to work with your employer to make it part of your work time to learn. Or find a way during your work time to read an interesting blog post or to learn something that is relevant to your work. And this is a great investment. So in one of these conferences, I met two great people, which is Sandro and Nash. And about two years ago, they, they used their expertise in consulting and software development and said, let's, let's found a company together. And they founded the Codures. 
uh, which I'm now part of. And what happened in 2014 was I, I figured out I can't go any further in my current job. I've been for three years at the same company. I've um, really grown, but they're now keeping me at this level. I ask, how can we grow together? I want to learn more. I know there's so much out there. I've seen these conferences. I've talked to these people. They have discussions on a much higher level. We need to improve ourselves. We need to move on. But they said, no, the client won't pay for that. You're good enough, you know? So I was dissatisfied. And then I said, okay, I need to go somewhere else. And I decided to do a bigger step and I actually moved to London. I heard about the community there and I noticed that this was something that I wanted to do, to surround myself with people that have this great experience in their life. And what I did was, I actually moved to London, joined the Germans, and started doing an apprenticeship. So an apprenticeship is basically a time that you only focus on learning. So it's an integral part of the software craftsmanship community. People get together, uh, got together and, and wrote a lot about it, but as an apprentice, your focus is learning and you have a mentor. And I, I came to the office, I got a new computer, I got this Mac, and I was not used to using IntelliJ, using um, a UK keyboard, using a Mac. So that was the first task, learning all these things. Then I practiced good coding, I started my own pet project, I read blog posts, I wrote blog posts, I gave talks at community events, I started organizing more community events in London. So basically, I was really focused on my career, and really took charge of that. And this has led to great things for me, because this year I've um, gotten many new opportunities. In the end of, in fall, I graduated, graduated from the apprenticeship to be a full-blown software craftswoman, which doesn't mean that I will stop learning, but it means that I'm now part of the craftsman at this company, and I have the same rights and same responsibilities. And what I'm doing is, I'm traveling all over Europe, giving talks at conferences. I was asked by the client to go to Bangalore to work with the team there for four weeks to give them a training on those good practices. And now I've been asked to start a new team and lead a new team. And this is, for me, an amazing thing. If I look back four years when I was in crisis and didn't know what to do, and now it's, so much has happened. And it's because I found this community and I found this, let's call it for now a calling, right? Because I'm very invested in it. And um, yeah, it, it gave me a great experience. So if you're interested in this kind of things, if you want to improve yourself uh, in your software development skills, there's a lot of things you can do. I would say the most important thing is to find other people who feel the same. So you can find a mentor, you can find people at your company, you can find um, people locally in your um, in your town and start on this. Start on practicing, start on learning and don't just use your free time because your free time is very valuable but also try to improve things at work. And in your company you can start running things and you can talk to your employer and you can say okay we want to meet at lunchtime and we want to give lightning talks, we want to talk about what is new or we want to do like a company open space and get together and learn together. Or we want to improve our way of deploying into production. So all these things, you have an idea, you find people that are aligned and you try to change your company as well. And if you realize you can't change your company, change your company. Find a better job where you can actually learn, where you can grow. Now, not everyone is is that privilege that can say, okay, I can just move to a different country, right? So you gotta judge for yourself if, if you can find something, but don't be trapped. You know, don't feel trapped in the company that you're in. And be courageous, because we are in a privileged position as software developers. We are needed and our expertise is needed. So try to use that a bit. Try not to be loyal to your company, be loyal to people. So. 
what is the state of the community that we have. The community is spread uh, all over the world. I know a lot more about the community in Europe because that's where I travel and that's why I go to events. There is the Global Day of Code Retreat that happens at the end of each year all over the world. You get together for one day, it's the same day all over the world, and you practice your uh, coding. You do five or six iterations and you pair with different people on the same exercise and it's a lot of fun and you learn a lot and you try new languages and you get to pair with different people. We have local events in almost all over Europe, so you can go to a meetup and search for software craftsmanship. Uh, if you live in a bigger town, there is the software craftsmanship Socrates conferences um, all over Europe. And these are the events that you can go to. We have something, for if you don't have any local groups, we have the slack.softwarecraftsmanship.org. It's basically um, a big group chat where people get together. And I don't know if you know Corey Hanks, who wrote the book, The Four Rules of Simple Design. But he is very active in the Slack. And what he does is he greets every new person that joins. He randomly does code reviews for you, so you can post your code and he will tell you uh, how to improve it. And he also did a live Q&A on the Slack where he answered questions. And there's a lot of channels uh, for different regional groups. You can go there and basically have uh, in ask questions, discuss blog posts, have your input. And it's a good way to get started if you, are, if you don't know where to go. Also, if you want to start your own, lo own local meetup group, there's a channel on the Slack where you can get asked questions and get help from other organizers. So uh, a person like me who has organized you know, maybe 20 meetups uh, already can go there and can help you or you know, I can myself learn new things about how to organize my group. So this was the short overview. I also have a couple of links there uh, on the slides that I'm going to post. For if you want to learn how to improve yourself, the book Apprenticeship Pattern is a really good book. Uh, and if you want to run the coding dojos, Emily Bach has written something about it. And if you want to learn how software craftsmanship came about and what it's really about, then Sandra's book, The Software Craftsman, is really a good idea. Because our community, a lot of times, they get people from the outside seem to think it's very elitist or it's hard to join this group, you know, and we are very much about the perfect code, but it's not what it is actually about. It's a lot about pragmatism, it's a lot about trying to find the right, the right solution for the right problem, and um, we are a very open community, so we do invite people to come in and give a talk on any subject that they like. It's, we, we, people are really there to help each other, as Adi helped me on my first software test. And I also put some links to some videos that are about, um, on our website, that are about how to do things like test driven development, how to use your IDE, and my personal blog posts are about the apprenticeship that I did and you can also, again, read the manifesto. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about quickly is the, yeah, the, this idea um, about um, how the meetups are run. Oftentimes you go to meetups and you have a very technical focus. So you have the Scala meetup or Docker meetup or you know it's about Java, but we try to be a bit more agnostic to technology, which means we have talks about how to organize a team, we have talks about test development that are not just focused on one language. So the idea is that this community is open to people from all technical backgrounds. We have people doing test development in Fortran and COBOL. And it's just amazing to me every day to figure this out. Or people that uh, refactor their spreadsheets, you know. So it's really a community that tries to cater for everyone that is passionate about the work that they do. All right, um, so that's it for now.
Uh, thank you very much for listening and I will be happy to answer all your questions.